Hi everyone, this is Professor Hall and we are talking today about Diane Lake's memoir, A Member of the Family. So this is the first of two lectures actually. Um, I wanted to give you guys some historical background. Just first to give you an overview of the memoir, um, we start in the late 1950s when Diane is about six or seven years old. She is living in suburbia in Minnesota. Her parents basically, through a number of steps, become very disillusioned with suburban life, and they want to be part of the growing hippie movement that's happening in California in the 1960s. So eventually, they uproot the family and they move to California. And at that point, they become very unstable and life becomes very nomadic, meaning that they move from um, commune to commune. They're part of the Haight-Ashbury scene for a while. They're at the Wavy Gravy Hog Farm. Um, and I'll give you guys a video to um, kind of get a better sense of uh, what life felt like at that time and in that place. So we've talked about the hippie movement in some of the other books that we've looked at, or we will eventually with Ruth Reichel's book, um, and that's a little bit of a different view of that movement, um, a much more lighter positive view. But essentially for Diane at a very young age, this makes her life quite unstable, and she ends up becoming involved with Charles Manson's family fairly early on as they are um, forming a group. Now, what ends up happening is that Diane's part of this group from ages 14 to 16. She was not part of the Manson family murders, meaning, <clears throat> sorry, meaning that she was not um, there those nights. She did not know um, at the time what happened, but she was there for the aftermath. People confessed things to her. Um, she was given things from one of the murder scenes, um, and she ended up being able to escape the cult and testified against them during the trials. Um, <clears throat> so at that point, she talks about basically the process of extricating herself from all of the brainwashing and the lies that had been told to her. Eventually trying to become um, a, a more stable and productive member of society that she had kind of always wanted to be um, when her life was kind of put into disarray when her parents moved. So the reason that I, I wanted to do this particular lecture is that when I looked things up about Charles Manson, to provide for you. Everything is very highly sensationalized and I just couldn't find like a good point by point of like, here's what happened when, um, without it being like, um, filled with like gory true crime kind of nonsense. Um, the book is part true crime. I mean, it, because of the nature of the book, there's a little bit of true crime in there, but really more than that, this is, it is a memoir. It is the story of this one woman's journey through really the worst thing somebody can go through and trying to triumph in the end. So um, with, with that having been said, just let's, let's kind of get into it here and give you a point by point of what happened and when. Um... First, Charles Manson is born in 1934. Um, there are some stories about his childhood, and she mentions some of them in the book. Like, he claimed that his mother was a prostitute, that at certain points she tried to, like, sell him for a pint of beer. There's really no evidence that that's true. Um, Diane seems to think that it might be part of the lore that he was building about himself. Like he's always been rejected by the world and that kind of thing. At any rate, he becomes basically a career criminal fairly early in his life. So he was married twice and he had two children whom he abandoned. Um, and then he goes to jail 
for transporting women across state lines for the purposes of prostitution. Um, so pimping, um, stealing cars, um, there are a number of smaller charges in there, forging checks, um, human trafficking, all of those kind of things. So he was in jail for seven years, and in March of 1967, he becomes paroled. At this point, his plan was to kind of learn from all of the other pimps and human traffickers that he had met in prison and emulate what they were doing to really um, have power over women and to gain a lot of money. What ends up happening is that when he comes out in 1967, he sees that the world that he has left has changed quite dramatically because we had this almost cultural revolution from 1960 to 1967. That's the, the time that he was in prison. So when he comes out, he kind of very quickly, and this is a pattern that we're going to see in the book, he changes and becomes almost like a chameleon to be what he needs to be because he is a sociopath. That's what sociopaths do. So he um, meets Mary Bruner in April of 1967. She becomes basically one of his first family recruits. He sees that in California, there are a lot of gurus popping up. There's a lot of interest in various spiritualities. There's a lot of drug use, and the drug use is kind of playing a role in all of these um, communal living situations and, and that kind of thing. So he recruits Mary Bruner in April. In May, he begins recruiting other women, um, Lynette uh, Squeaky Frome, who we'll talk about a little bit later, um, Ruth Ann Morehouse, um, her father Dean, um, also kind of part of their group. And then around this time, also the author of our story, Diane. In the summer of 1967, I think very early on in the summer is where he meets Diane and the book describes their meeting. Um, then more troubled girls start to be recruited. So um, Patricia Krenwinkel, Susan Atkins, and all of these girls are about 18, 19, 20. I think the oldest is maybe 25. Diane is the youngest, and she is 14 when she joins their group. She becomes emancipated from her parents earlier on. Um, and then people that her parents kind of introduced her to, those people introduced her to Charles Manson and his girls. So in the fall, um, they move to L.A. from the Haight-Ashbury district, and they start trying to make connections in the music world because basically Manson wanted to he wrote a number of songs in prison, and he had this idea that he would become like this very famous musician and guru and have all of these women and, and have his music out in the world and that kind of thing. They start dumpster diving um, because they don't really have that much money. <laughs> Two of the women are pregnant. Both Susan and Mary eventually give birth to um, Manson's children. And in March of 1968... He meets up with Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys. Now, the Beach Boys, at this point, were still a fairly popular band. <clears throat> they had kind of a poppier sound in the early 60s. Now their sound is starting to change. And Dennis Wilson becomes almost like a devotee of this group. He allows them to stay at his house. He's very often um, in their living Place. At, at one point, they're in what's called the staircase house because it has like a, a big staircase on the outside. And this is going to become extremely important because um, that summer in 1968, now Diane's been with them about a year, Manson hopes to score a record deal. So Dennis Wilson brings him in and he plays for the producers, and he has a long session, and as described in the book, he kind of um, is disillusioned with the process, becomes very angry, almost to the point of violence, and leaves, and it seems like 
this sets a seed for some of what's going to happen later on down the road. So at this point, they move out to the Spahn Ranch. That's owned by a man named George Spahn, S-P-A-H-N, not Spahn with a W. But George Spahn owns this ranch, and he's elderly, but he is interested in young girls. And frequently, uh, Manson gives Spahn the ladies to please him in exchange, basically, for... Um, staying on what used to be an old movie set where they would film things like Bonanza and um, a number of spaghetti westerns and things like that. In 1968, in September, um, Dennis Wilson revised one of Manson's songs called Cease to Exist, and he renames it Never Learn to Love, and they use it for their album. Now, what the heck does that have to do with anything? Well, later on, when they go to commit the murders, um, they're going to a house that was previously, sorry, was previously stayed in by the Beach Boys. So it's really unclear as to whether they thought, perhaps, that Dennis Wilson would be there that night. Um, and certainly... He had, um, in March of 1969, Manson went to um, this man's house, Terry Melcher, who had sort of not exactly promised him a record contract, but hinted that there might be a record contract in his um, future. So he goes to Melcher's house on Cielo Drive. He shows up in the middle of a party, and he basically... Um, cases the place, um, possibly to do violence at that point and possibly to do violence later. Now, at the same time, one of his um, followers, one of the members of the family, is a man by the name of Tex Watson. He makes a bad drug deal with a dealer named Bernard Lotsapapa Crow. Um, Manson shoots this dealer in the chest, thinks that he has died, um, but the man actually recovers and is able to survive. Um, in July, another Manson follower um, has another drug deal that goes bad with a man named Gary Hinman. Gary Hinman had kind of been part of the Manson family um, or at least a friend of theirs sometimes staying with them. They have a confrontation. Um, Manson cuts off his ear. He orders Bobby Boussoulet, um, one of the family, to shoot Gary Hinman. And um, after he dies, um, Susan Atkins, who is there along with Mary Bruner and Bruce Davis, um, they write messages on the wall in his blood so that here they put political piggy in part to kind of get the focus off of them. So you can kind of see how things are beginning to escalate. First there is um, a, a shooting, then there is a an actual murder, and um, Bobby Boussoulet is, is booked for Hinman's murder, but they're not yet connecting him to the Manson family. So August 9th, um, the Tate murders happen at Cielo Drive, and that's typically um, what's talked about are the Tate-LaBianca murders. The LaBiancas were murdered the day after on August 10th. So <clears throat> essentially on August 9th, um, Charles Manson had ordered a number of his followers to go up to the house on Cielo Drive that was owned by Terry Melcher, the record producer, and to kill anybody who was there. Again, it's not clear if he thought that possibly um, Dennis Wilson from the Beach Boys would be there, or if he was just taking his anger out on anybody who was in that house and in the position that he kind of wanted to be in. 
Um, there are other things that he's telling his followers at the time. He um, basically trained them with knives to do violence and tested them to see who would be the most violent and who was the least violent. He does not send Diane because she's a nonviolent person, basically. And when he gives her the knife, she kind of is like, what the heck do I do with this when they're kind of practicing? Um, but he tells his followers that this is part of a racial uprising. The civil rights movement is going on at the time, and he's kind of playing into those fears. There is a lot of evidence that he did not believe that at all, and that he was using that to control them. He also was giving them a lot of LSD, which we'll, we're going to talk about in the next lecture, um, again, to kind of keep them addled and to keep them uh, under his control. So on his directions, four members of the Manson family on the night of August 9th, um, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, Linda Kasabian, and Tex Watson. They go up to the house and they kill everyone there, including Sharon Tate, who was pregnant and married to Roman Polanski at the time. She was an up-and-coming actress who had just been um, in a, a few movies, including Valley of the Dolls. Abigail Folger, who was the coffee heiress, um, Jay Sebring, who was a celebrity hairdresser, Abigail Folger's boyfriend, um, Wozniak Borowski, and Stephen Parent, who was an 18-year-old visitor. Two of the individuals, um, Abigail Folger and her boyfriend, were able to um, or tried to rather escape. They ran away and they were chased down. So all of those individuals were um, were stabbed. And um, Manson had basically told them to make it look witchy, um, meaning to, again, write different phrases on the wall with their blood and to make it look like it was this racial uprising that he had been warning them about and that he was trying to supposedly um, kick off or, or escalate the situation. The following night, the four killers from the night before, plus Manson, plus Leslie Van Housen and Steve Clem Gorgon, they go to the LaBianca house, and they commit two more murders. And I don't know if the choosing of that house was random or not, but it doesn't seem to have the same ties um, as the other house had. But Manson basically says it was too messy, people got away, so he has to show them how to do it. And at that point, um, they kill... Um, Rosemary and Lino LaBianca. So, so at the same time, um, in preparation for that, they had been doing what was called creepy crawlies, where they would go into the night and um, break into people's houses and steal little, doing like pet, kind of petty theft. They were also involved in other thefts as well, including... Um, stolen dune buggies, some of which were government property. Um, Manson um, burned one of these, and the the LAPD, as a result, raided the ranch. Um, that happens in August of August, uh, the sixteenth of August. Sorry. Um, so, essentially, at this point, some of the members are taken to jail, some are not, but they um, are all released because the only thing that the cops know about at this point are the dune buggies. They're not tying them into the murders at all. On August 25th, um, they murder Shorty Shea, who was uh, the ranch hand at the Spawn Ranch, who they had had many run-ins with. Um, it's not fully known whether he knew about the murders or heard about them. It's quite possible um, it's very clear 
it's very clear that um, he had not been getting along with them for quite some time and now could possibly be a liability. So at this point, Diane finds out about the murders, but she is really too scared to come forward. Um, and it's not until October um, when the police raid the ranch again for car theft um, that they find out that one of the women in prison kind of boasts about the murders and they realize how all of these murders were connected. So we have at that point um, in the book, we see Diane kind of struggling with whether or not to tell the truth and um, eventually she does and then she testifies um, against them. So what then happens is a very um, lengthy kind of crazy trial where there are a lot of antics on the part of Manson and some of his followers, um, some of the people who were involved in the killings and some not. And then in September of 1975, after um, Manson and, and the other individuals have been um found guilty and put in prison, Squeaky Frome, wearing a red nun's habit, pointed a Colt 45 at President Ford. Um, the gun did not go off, so she was unsuccessful in her assassination, possibly attempt. Um, but she was also um, part of Manson's cult, and basically even years later when she was released from prison for that assassination attempt um said that she still loved manson and that that kind of love didn't go away so i'm telling you this um and i'm sorry if it seems boring but i kind of wanted to tell you in the most boring way that i could because what happens is that um because of the antics and because of the craziness of this story you have everything that the american media loves right you have sex you have drugs you have rock and roll and you have a very kind of bizarre looking smaller guy who somehow has this like weird charisma over these women they're all quite a bit younger than him and they're doing his bidding and um they're murdering people in his name and during the trial they're like shaving their heads he carves an x into his forehead and says he's been x'd out from the world they carve x's into their forehead he pretends that his hands are bleeding um like like christ on the cross he he basically pokes his his hands and then starts bleeding and some of his followers think that that's real that that's really happening so because of all of this, he kind of becomes this larger than life infamous kind of character where, you know, it's like the boogeyman, right? Stories are, are told about him and things get conflated as if he was um, some kind of genius or the devil himself or, you know, what whatever the case may be. And I think what is sort of beautiful about Diane's book. She has a very straightforward style of um, telling you exactly what happened. And so she's not trying to sensationalize anything. She's just telling you her story and her role in things and really trying to show how a vulnerable child could be pulled into this sort of thing. Um, and um, we'll talk more about that next time. But for this time, I hope that you guys have a little bit of a better understanding of um, how some of this violence kind of escalated from just, not that it's not violent to, to, to do be involved in human trafficking, but moving from human trafficking and check forgery to um, to car theft and theft of property and breaking and entering and then um, drug dealing and um, 
a, a deadly assault and then moving all the way up and escalating to murder and and then um you know murder of more than one person so so mass murder in a way the um those are things that as a 14 year old especially when she's brought into this group she really could never have known or even imagined but i think it's also a story about the darker side of the 1960s and how a lot of the values that were praised at the time um the underbelly of that and the criminal element that was trying to exploit those things so we'll talk more about that next time when we get into some of the themes and um i will See you then. Thank you.